I know some of you have a fair amount of experience with this uh, with this art form, and some maybe not so much. Uh, I hope I don't uh, repeat too much or start too basically uh, for everybody, but a little patience. I just want to make sure that uh, we all kind of start in the same place at least. And when I use a, a term for uh, a design or part of one, um, we all understand what it is I'm saying. So I'll start out pretty basic. And we only have uh, two short sessions, so we'll have to zip along kind of fast and we won't be able to do everything that it would be nice to cover. But I'll try to at least um, share some thoughts and ideas that I've had over the years about putting these kinds of designs together uh, based on looking at the old work. And um, hopefully uh, that you'll be able to derive some benefit from that and you'll be able to apply it to what you do yourselves. Um, I, I learned this uh, little by little starting when I was a teenager. Uh, growing up in Seattle and for some inexplicable reason I never got quite as interested in anything else so for better or worse I'm still at it and uh, along the way I know I, I was very frustrated at first trying to uh, create these designs I got a copy of Bill Holmes book which was pretty new at that point it came out in 1965 I started looking at it in 66 or 7 and um, I could find I could copy designs reasonably well once I went through that and kind of understood what was going on but to actually create something was a larger hurdle for me and it took uh, quite a few years before I felt really confident at it and then uh, as I got more confident I, I found certain ways of looking at it and certain ways of approaching uh, design composing that is making one up uh, that seem to make it easier so hopefully it will also make it easier for you I'm not sure we'll see um, so I don't know if how many were I was probably standing in the way so people couldn't see what I was doing here very much but uh, I'll start with some images and we'll go through and I want to talk about some principles of design is what I would call them. Um, things that influence the way the designs go together and the shapes and relationships between them that I think are part of the whole picture and part of uh, getting a better understanding of composition. Um, so maybe we could start with those and I'll see, There's that one's already off. Is somebody near that light switch? Uh, snicket there? Yeah, that's great. So <clears throat> just to put uh, kind of a context on uh, all these things, this is a, a wooden object that was recovered archeologically in the Prince Rupert area from a wet site uh, so that it survived what they think is about 2,000 years. Uh, archaeologists think this is 2,000 years old. And it's, I, I've never seen it in person. I don't know for sure how big it is. I'm guessing from the scale of the grain of the wood and all that, that it's maybe somewhere along this big. And when I first saw this picture, um, without knowing where it was from, I assumed this was down from down in Washington because it looks more like Salish style design than it does like Northern style, what we think of as from this area, Haida, Simchan, Tlingit, as well as uh, Haisla, Hiltsuk, and uh, Bella Kula, or Nuhak people down in BC, all used the same system, at least in the 19th century. And south of that, you get down to Vancouver Island and down into Puget Sound and that, they use very different design styles. And this really seems to have more in common with uh, southern BC and Washington style than it does with northern work. But at 2,000 years old, um, this was one of the few objects that came out of this wet site 
where they recovered canoe paddles, uh, bent corner containers, and other kinds of things, none of which had any two-dimensional design on it. This is one of the few objects that came out of that site that did have any two-dimensional design on it. So it's interesting to see. And you know, we can see a, a real oval, not really an ovoid type thing, but a, almost a true oval, and just a simple trigon shape here and another one that's a little more faint up here, and then a incised line that appears to be a mouth going back. Now, I, and, and I have, couldn't describe this in design terms, and I don't know for sure what this is. There appear to be little uh, wooden pegs that attached it to something, although I don't know what. Um, I'd be interested to know, to see that actually and know more about it. But it's interesting to see the stage of the design uh, at that point in time. So this is a bone comb, and this also came from the Prince Rupert area. This one says it's three and a half inches long, and they estimate this between 1,000 and 2,000 years old. And again, from Prince Rupert, from what even at that time would have been uh, Simchan country, probably. And uh, well here, they, down here it says one to 2,000. Here it says 8,800 to 1,000. So it makes it closer to 1,000 years old, 1,200, something like that. Um, and it has more characteristics of formline art, northern style formline art, but it still has a lot in common with the southern styles. And they have examples of that kind of work, archaeological examples that go back three or four thousand years. So, um, for example, this is the comb itself. This is a drawing of, of the opposite side, actually. But here you can see there's a, an eye form, and it's just made up of two trigons, and with, that's a, this little split thing that you commonly see in the design work. Uh, it's like a triangle with inward sloping sides, and people have used different names for these, and I like the name that I first heard Robert Davidson use, meaning trigon. Uh, for an English term, it serves all right. Um, unfortunately, I've never heard any native language terms for any of these design elements. I've, I would imagine that there were some, but um, nobody bothered to record it, and the use of those words fell out of common, uh, the common population, so they don't appear to be known today. But um, now Robert Davidson calls these trinegs instead of trigons, and I find that rings less nicely in my ears. But he, he calls it that because it's, it's a negative element, meaning it's an unpainted element. So, uh, and he wants to distinguish that, but I, I still use the word trigon. So there's, here's that eye looks like this. It's, there's, there's no real eyeball itself. I'll make it a little slightly more like we'd be used to seeing. And that's it. This is carved out. This is carved out. And that that's, uh, serves as an eye form. And you can see the obvious relationship of that to what we're more used to seeing in the form that uh, even if we use a round eye and then we put a eyelid line around it and I'll exaggerate it to be slightly more like that than it might be otherwise. And so when, when this is carved out and this is carved out, we've got basically what this is, right? Or this is basically what this is. So there's a real direct relationship, but um, you don't see it done this way in today's or even within the last couple hundred years of this design style. And then we see what look like U-shapes and splits and all that. Here's a part of another eye here that seems to wrap around the comb. Um, but we don't see in this one, 
we don't see any ovoid shapes really and um, it's hard to tell if this represents anything. Uh, there's another view that shows both sides in the drawing form. So even on the other side, this is, might be considered a, an ovoid as it wraps around the corner. Here's one end of it. Here's the other end of it. And it's got a, it looks like just a trigon there. It's hard to tell what's going on. And one tall kind of a U-shape with what could be a split going up it. And then uh, another eye form here. But it's, it's, it's not real northern form line style. And at 1,200 years old in an area where form line style within the historic period at least was already fully developed. So it, it's just these are some of the few clues there are to how old this design style is. And it may or may not uh, predate a thousand years ago. But by the time um, any Europeans showed up around here, one more hole, come on. There we go. One more. There. Um, this, this little ivory bird, probably a little seabird, um, was a worn around the neck of a Haida woman and she gave it to somebody on Juan Perez's Spanish ship off Langara Island somewhere in 1774. So th this is the, the earliest recorded object from the Northwest Coast that has two-dimensional form line design on it. And um, this is a drawing that Bill Holm did for an article somewhere that just shows what this wing might look like if it were painted black and red. This, this version is a little more angular than this one, but it's the same idea of a, a, if you turn that over, you'd see it as a, a face with an eye, a cheek, and a mouth, and feathers coming off the back. And it's, here it's just in incised lines into the ivory. So it's only like probably this big, somewhere in that neighborhood. And, um, and it shows really fully developed the same style of flat designs that uh, we know from any period since then. Uh, however, it's, it does have some characteristics that make it a little bit different than work from the middle or the latter part of the 19th century. The, the painted lines are, are fairly heavy, uh, broad. The carved out areas are quite small. So the area above the eye here that's carved out is really narrow. The area below it is slightly wider, but not much. And the mouth is quite narrow. And then these little incised crescents that define the movement of these form lines and the cheek design are, are very narrow, small little slits. And I believe that probably is the case because this most likely developed as a carver's art to start with by cutting lines like this, cutting out negative spaces and leaving a pattern on the surface that created the design. So rather than in this case or and any art ivory carver doing this today would do the same thing, that you don't paint the design on there and then carve through it, you just cut out the negative spaces and leave the form lines on the surface. So anything that's black or red would be on the surface and anything that's carved away is initially unpainted and then certain areas like around eye sockets and that get painted that lovely blue-green color. But um, this, this whole system, like that older comb and the other wooden object, probably started as just that. The carvers would cut out negative spaces and they began to to visualize these form lines around it. And little by little, it developed into a, um, a conventionalized system. And that's what we know today. So it's interesting to see some things that show kind of the development of that. This, this uh, old helmet uh, 
was acquired by um, someone on the Malaspina expedition, a Spanish, another Spanish expedition up here. Uh, he went, he stopped in around um, uh, the west side of Prince of Wales, down around where Craig is now, and up in Yakutat. We don't know for sure where this came from, but it was in 1791. So this has been in Spain since 1791. And uh, there are only a handful of objects that date back that far from that, that kind of period. But it shows the, the state of the evolution of this system, how it was in the, the 18th century. So it's like 225 years ago in that neighborhood. Um, 220 more like. So at this point, again, the, even though this is painted and not carved, as uh, the little v arch over the top of the helmet, this is a piece of copper here and then the wood that is carved above that. There's a kind of like a little bird design. There's a pair of eyes and what's a leg and a foot and some little feathers coming back from that. And then this painting on the back of the helmet wraps around, this part wraps around underneath the face, so this painted element comes all the way to the center here. And um, again, you see really broad form lines, the carved out areas, which would be the unpainted spots, like around that uh, ovoid shape there, very round ovoid, is quite narrow, the, the ovoid itself is big, it, it goes a long way to filling that space. And then uh, the little crescent shapes are quite narrow. You've just got solid U-shapes coming up this way and one tall U-shape working this way that's partly made up of these ovoids. So there's no bottom to this U-shape form line. It ends right here, but the impression of it comes all the way down to here in the form of this ovoid. So there's some interesting what I call form line overlapping going on there. It's not literal overlaps like this, but where two lines share the same space. And I'll talk more about that later. Anyway, it shows a, a, a very old style from uh, the 1790s. And of course, this may have been 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years older than that. We don't know. But that's when it was acquired. We don't know when it was made or the other object as well. So then uh, just to clarify some terms that uh, I'll be throwing around up here, this is a little zigzag line that is commonly seen on things from like the Columbia River in that area. Um, as a design down there, they, they do a, like what's called chip carving in the European tradition. And in fact, you see this design chip carved in Europe, you see it in uh, Southeast Asia, you see it in Africa, it's really all over the world and it's usually formed uh, in a flat surface by just carving out these triangles, beveling them down like this and that leaves this line on the surface and so it's a, it's a simple way of, de of creating a design by positive and negative space. So in this case the negative space the carved out portions are black here and the part left on the surface is uncolored in this example. Um, but this would be what we'd call positive space, the zigzag line, and the triangles we'd call negative space. Just, you could call it the other way around if you want, but just for the sake of understanding, uh, we'll, we'll use it that way. And then we've got the ovoid shape and I like to call that the grandmother of designs for several reasons. Um, it's got a real central position in the design system, not meaning it's always in the middle, but it's important to any portion of a design. It's, they seem to form like little visual centers and other design elements flow out from them. You think of it that way and then look at it as we go along. Um, 
And I suspect there was a, a original Aboriginal name for these shapes, uh, but we don't know what they are. So ovoid will work. Uh, Bill Holm coined that word because it's not really uh, an oval. A real oval uh, is like this. It's the same shape left and right. And it's also the same shape up and down. So it's the same curvature all the way around. Where this form is not that way, do you know? It's um, generally got more arch on the top and much less on the bottom. So that it's the same, or often intended to be the same, doesn't always end up that way. <laughs> Uh, the same left and right, but the top and bottom, so to speak, are quite different. This has this big arch top, and this has a, a flatter bottom. Now, some people, and we'll see examples in, in some of the old work that we'll look at, where, where that bottom isn't really flat. Sometimes it arches slightly upward, sometimes radically upward, depending on how it's being, the shape is being used. And sometimes it'll, it'll actually curve slightly down. So uh, they're all, there's, that's kind of the range of difference in them anyway. And the tops can be more arched or less as well. But we'll talk more about that momentarily. And I have this illustration to, to show what, what another word that Holm coined being form line. And he used that word because the line itself has form, almost like calligraphy, where a, a brush stroke will start wide and taper down and things like that. So he called them form line because they change thickness as they move around a design. So um, form line, and then this is what I would call a fine line, just to distinguish between the two, meaning that the line itself is the same, intended to be the same thickness all the way, no matter what it does. and we see these in certain places within designs. You see them uh, almost like a border around design sometimes. But to distinguish between something that's meant to be thin and something that's meant to have form, we'll call form line and fine line. And, well, we'll get to that next one here. The, um, another interesting quality here that these shapes have in them uh, ovoids can be almost round, like just some of them are really circles. And sometimes it's, it's like a circle with a very slightly flattened bottom, almost like a, a basketball that's going flat or a, a bubble that lands on a table and then the bottom flattens out. But some are round. And in a circle, um, one, they don't really have any... Well, they have all directions, is what I'm trying to say. They have all directions inherent in them, like the spokes of a wheel. Um, something could attach to this in, in any direction. But an ovoid, really, by its shape, as soon as you create it that way, it emphasizes this direction primarily and also this direction. And that becomes important in putting designs together and how, how designs attach, where they attach, and the directions that they flow away from the ovoid in. And that'll make more sense as we go along. And another principle that's, that's built into the art style and has been over the years is uh, what in Holmes' book he called non-concentricity, meaning it's not concentric which is the same as eccentric, but he called it non-concentric anyway. And a concentric circle or set of circles is one like this where all these circles, one, two, three, four, fine line circles, all have the same center. So concentric, they all have the same center. And they're all consequently the same distance apart all the way. Now here's the same four circles. This is this one, this one, this one, this one but they're no longer concentric, right? They're now eccentric or non-concentric. 
So the center of each one is in a different place. And interestingly, um, this one looks very kind of static. It might be spinning, but it, otherwise it, it just sort of describes something that's very still and static. Where this, just by the form of it and the, the placement of the circles, has more action in it visually. So you look at it and you see these, these lines that come down and then they get very thin down here and, and these are like the centers are dropping down and here this one the center is moving up and it ends up looking like there's much more going on in there. There's activity in this image and this is stasis so to speak. And that's kind of built into the design form and we see it in shapes like this. Now this one I've exaggerated deliberately. So here's an ovoid that's taller than it is wide and each one of these lines, the edge of outside edge, the inside edge of the black, the fine line, and the edge of the inner ovoid are like those circles. Um, and they've moved around, the center of each has moved around, they're not concentric. And um, that's a principle that's built into the art. Some artists use it more than others. Some artists will exaggerate in this direction more than others. And not to say that's only, the only good way to do it, it's just the, the something that you see. So, uh, I would, so just in, as we're doing this work, I'm going to be talking about the inside edge of a form line, and by that I'm talking about this part right here the inside edge of the black form line, and then there's the, I would describe the outside edge, and then in the case of an ovoid, there's 99.9% .9 of the time, there's an inner ovoid within it, and 95 at least, or 6 or 7% of the time, there's a fine line around it. And sometimes, the fine line is farther from the inner ovoid at the bottom than it is at the top. In other words, it's non-concentric. And frequently, the inner ovoid is floating higher than the middle of this space from here to here, but not always. And this one is exaggeratedly floating upward. Uh, and so is the whole form, as if it's been stretched. And some artists, and we'll show an example of one, use that principle uh, real to a great degree. Th these are two simple silkscreen prints that Robert Davidson did in the late 60s, early 70s. And at that time he was leaving off the fine line on the inside here. But you can see he's really exaggerated all that non-concentric principle, see? So he's got the, the form line here and then the inner ovoid and there's a relief within that inner ovoid, an unpainted negative space, also ovoid shape, and then another positive ovoid within that, all floating upward. So it ends up looking like you took a normal design that you drew in, a, in ink on a piece of rubber balloon, and then you stretched it like that, like the old stretch your dollar farther thing. You know? And uh, then in addition to that, in the ovoid, particularly on this side, he, uh, he really mm, exaggerated the length and the taper of this U-shape and another U-shape within it that has a split. And that all adds to that stretched effect. And then use this uh, unpainted negative ovoid within this space. And again, the elongation of that works with all these. And he called these feather designs at the time. And uh, they work nicely for that. But it really shows that capturing that principle of floating upward or, or non-concentric forms. And it, you can see that it's really built in to the form line system because of the way an ovoid shape is thickest on the top, thinner on the sides, and the thinnest on the bottom. 
and then generally speaking the inner ovoid floats higher than center. That's not always the case. It all depends on the artist. So if we go beyond these, uh, oh, we'll get to this U-shaped one. So now thinking about directions, if the ovoid has sort of four directions really emphasized within it, U-shape has basically one, right? It's, right? it's going this way. And that becomes useful when you think about putting designs together. Um, also, U-shapes are the thickest on the end. I won't call it the top because they're always turned this way and that. Same with an ovoid, really. But in this position, it's the top. Thickest here, thinner on the sides, and then it tapers down to nothing on the bottom. This one has very thin legs, and so that's like some red painted or secondary U-shapes, but it shows the principle. And then here are two more like form line, U, typical form line U shapes that again each one describes one main direction of flow and they're thickest on the end, thinner on each side and the sides are generally intended to be the same but you do see variation. And then they taper down to nothing as they turn outward usually at the bottom. So those are just common characteristics. Most of you are familiar with them anyway. And then when the two go together, we have the, the form line ovoid in the center and three U-shapes attached to it. One that comes right off the top line of the outside edge of the ovoid form line, keeps going all the way down to the bottom outside edge of the ovoid form line. And within it is the negative space, unpainted space, Here's the negative unpainted ovoid space and so on with each of these. And most commonly you see U-shapes, other design forms flowing out from these ovoids in one of these four directions. You, at least in the older traditional work, you don't commonly see U-shapes coming off the corner of an ovoid like that, you know, going in this direction. If, depending on how something sits in a design, it might sort of lean more toward the corner, but generally speaking, the principle uh, has design elements flowing in, in either of these directions. Could come, this one comes right off the outside edge at the side, comes up and, and turns this way at the top. So this leg turns that way, this leg keeps tapering down straight, so the legs end up being quite different, but it's still uh, part of the world of U-shape, so to speak, and they taper down at that point and taper down at this point. And then same with this one here, With this one has a little bit slimmer legs and a wider end on it. So I know some uh, form line instructors or teachers will um, describe proportion, pretty, sometimes pretty specific proportions of how wide this should be in relation to this and so on like that. And I like to keep it a little bit simpler than that. Uh, because I think if you look at the old work, there's really a pretty broad range of differences from one artist or one area to another um, to begin with. And then through time, there are differences as well. And as the design changed from generation to generation, uh, you can, it's easy to see how things that were done in the 18th century, some of them continued and other things were added on to the tradition, became part of the tradition from succeeding generations putting in their input. So um, it's really hard to say that there, you know, the, this design should be this thick up here and this thin down here because you can always find exceptions. So this this shows what are basically two, each one of these is composed of really two ovoids. It's as if, in fact, I think they're the same one. Uh, if this was a solid black ovoid right here, and this was a, on a separate piece of paper, a solid white one, you could stick it right there so that it's close to the center. If it was right in the center, this and this would be the same width. So it's just only slightly sagging down in this case. 
so that the top is thicker than the bottom and the sides are somewhere in between. But if you let that sag down a little farther, the same white ovoid, you'd end up with a top that's many times wider than the bottom down here. And we'll see example, we can find examples that are like both of these in the old work. So one's not right and the other wrong. They're just part of the range of possibility. So most, most uh, people working in a style find a, a proportion that is comfortable with them, looks right to them, and people will stick with it. And that's part of why you can recognize different artists' work by their style. Um, so anyway, we'll go from there. And then uh, the softness or hardness of the corners is also something that differs from one time period to another, one artist or one area to another. So that um, this is a, a quite a rounded corner example, and there are many that are way rounder corner than this, uh, with a, a kind of a, a typical, from the, at least in relation to the 18th century work, proportion of the top and the bottom. But then some artists like a tighter radius on each of these corners. So you could say there's four corners, two upper ones and two lower ones. And here they're really quite a tighter radius so that the, all the corners are what you could call more angular. Even the top has a more deliberate peak in it, more angular. So uh, again, these are intended to be symmetrical, the same left and right, and different top and bottom. And so when it comes to drawing these, uh, sometimes it's an easy thing for people, sometimes it's a little bit harder. But I find that if you, um, if you kind of visualize a center line up and down, and then you draw half of the shape, like that, and then in your mind's eye, you figure, okay, this is this wide. So I make this side out to here. And then watching the imaginary center line, draw the other side so that it sort of fits. And you end up with a semi-symmetrical shape. Another way to look at it, and you can see it real clearly in this one, is like the front of a tribal house, old style tribal house with a low pitch to the roof. You might be looking at something like that. And the sides are straight up and down. The peak is in the, close at least, to the, in the center. And then if you just round off all these corners, you end up with a real good ovoid shape. So if sometimes it helps to visualize those kinds of things as you're getting comfortable with these forms. So sh some shapes are real angular, some are rounded, it's, it's fine, they're all the same. And then there's that same illustration over there. And then <clears throat> these two shapes, the ovoid and the U-shape, which are, are really the primary two. I think a lot of other shapes, S's, L's, and other alphabetical descriptions are really still, I don't use those much term-wise because to me they're still parts of these. Um, like a, what some people call an S, and I sometimes use the word myself, is like half of a U shape, so it's not really a different thing. But they have, they have a lot in common. There's the whole thing of the form line being the widest on the top and thinner on each side, same as this, and then the thinnest on the bottom, and here they taper out to nothing. And they have the, the nature of these corners are often similar too. Although, of course, they're familiar with uh, the kind of designing that became in entrenched in Chilkat weaving, which is an 18th century style of design work, what was, what was uh, about when that style of weaving developed. Um, you see 
rounded ovoids and absolutely square cornered u shapes so there's there's that as well but in a lot in a lot of painted examples you'll see square cornered u shapes as well but you'll also see rounded ones and when they are rounded they tend to echo the shapes that you find in the ovoid so the corners down here are related to the corners here and so on to the extent that you can actually kind of switch them around a little bit. If you cut an ovoid and turn that side out, it would be a U-shape. And if you took a U-shape and bent it the other way, it would be an ovoid. And um, in fact, sometimes you see a shape like this that's like half ovoid and half U-shape. It's not real common, but you see it sometimes. In, uh, uh, and you see it a lot more commonly in modern work, contemporary work. But the, the point is they have a, these forms in common and that's part of what artists make use of in, um, okay, good, in putting designs together. So then I wanted to, to start doing some of that, put, taking those shapes and putting them together. So I'm gonna back this up. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this too. Easy come, easy go. So I mentioned earlier, and we'll see examples in the old work of form lines overlapping, and I'll illustrate what I mean by that. Um, and I'll also suggest a couple other things along the way. For example, I'll draw um, what's right now just a fine line ovoid. And of course, to make this into a form line, we have to draw the other edge of the form line, right? So, and, and here we come to a, a decision, a crossroads of sorts, and that is, do you draw the inside edge first or do you draw the outside edge first? How many draw the outside edge first? Yeah. It, just so you know, Bill Holm and some other people I know draw the outside edge first. But I'm going to make a suggestion that you draw the inside edge first. And I'll show you why. Um, it's based on the realization that um, the inside edge is always continuous. Nothing interrupts the inside edge. But the outside edge is almost always discontinuous as something else connects to it. And if you were to carve these lines, you, you could carve the inside edge, if you're gonna V-cut it, say, you'd carve the inside edge all the way around. But you can't do that on the outside edge because there are other lines that connect to it. So you're, only, you're actually only carving parts of it as you go around the outside of the ovoid form line. So that being the case, uh, well, we'll see exactly the, the out, upshot of that. So here, if I've drawn the inside edge first, if I was just going to draw a plain ovoid sitting by itself, it wouldn't make much difference whether you drew the inside edge first or the outside edge. But fact is, and we can see that if I go back a couple of shots here. Well, let's go to say this one. So here, the, if you're to carve this, the inside edge is continuous, but the outside edge, you'd only carve from here to here and from here to here. In fact, you wouldn't even carve all the way around there because you'd, you might have something touching this line in here as well. And you wouldn't, you, then you could carve here. But the outside edge is not continuous. That's what I'm getting at. And so if you learn to think from the inside edge out, you see this thing differently than if you think 
from the outside edge in. At least I found that to be true. And um, I found that once I started doing that, it freed up a whole lot of stuff in my mind that, oh, okay, now I can see this. And I think that it was important to the old timers as well because when they set out to put a design on a flat surface, say, or even not a flat surface, but say a box um, or anything else, they're working not with a pencil and a paper, right, and an eraser. They're working with a paintbrush, basically, maybe a, a paint stick that would make a fine little line. But it, once it was on there, it was on there. And if they started painting from the outside edge, they'd have to go back and erase some of these connective lines and stuff like that, see? And you can't do that. Yeah? Do you have any examples of uh, people who were in that old-time traditional apprenticeship system if they made... They I, I've, I've never met anybody that learned the old, 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 old way that I talked to this about. Oh, okay. Talking about this. Like, Willie Marks, did he... Where did he start from, Nathan? Remember, uh, I can't really tell you exactly the history of Willie. Uh, yeah. uh, but his was more carving. His wasn't doing uh, two-dimensional design or oh. doing this kind of thing. This is a little oh. different than, because what he's explaining here is more what goes into a bentwood box, possibly or the two-dimensional design, such as uh, screens and so on. So it's a little different. There's more flat design. Okay. Thank you. And we'll see. Um, so at, at any rate, if um, in, in putting and applying a design to a space, and of course, if it's a symmetrical design, then you're trying to match the two sides. And that's where sometimes the use of templates would come in, but that template would be, I believe, a template of the inside edge, not the outside. And if you take, say you're trying to find the eye socket of a design, and you set your template there and you trace around it, that's the inside edge. And then you would start connecting that to the other side and creating the mouth and all that. But all that would, would alter, in its own way, the outside edge. So we'll, we'll see how that makes sense the farther we go along. Um, there, that will serve to illustrate that. So let's start by drawing the inside edge first, and then if, the, if we put a U-shape next to that, just standing next to it, uh, we could come up like this, maybe starting there, and U-shape would come up, maybe the same height of it, we'd come over here like this, and then we'd make similar characteristics, so the side would be maybe so thick, and then the other side coming down this way. And here are the two lines are right next to each other. In fact, these two lines are so close to each other in shape that we can overlap them. And here's what I mean by that. If we draw the inside edge of the ovoid here and the inside edge of the U-shape over here, So far, it looks the same, right? We've got, well, one little difference. This is higher than that. But, so we'll bring this down the shade further. So what if we actually take this line or this line and overlap the other one so that we now, then the outside edge might connect there and it could come all the way across like this. So that 
this is now one form line instead of two. I'm going to move my shade closer together so the two match a little more closely with this side. So now here's the outside edge of the U shape is here. I'm just going to dot it in. And the outside edge of the ovoid is here. And the two have actually overlapped. Now th this, you see this a lot and maybe you don't think of it that way, but maybe you do. And it, it's, it's, it's another principle that some, some artists will use more than others. Uh, the same artist won't necessarily use it in every opportunity. And we'll see examples of that. But when, when they do use it, um, it does a couple of things. It, it, you can use it to attach parts of a creature together and, and you end up with a different effect than if you don't overlap the form lines. And um, you get a whole different kind of sense of flow around the design if, if there are some of these kinds of overlaps than if you're there not. And we've seen examples even in the that old 18th century clinket work uh, where they use this principle, like the back of that helmet. So then, well, what about this? You wouldn't just paint that all solid black, right? No. You'd use those little, uh, what Holm called transitional devices, and that's the crescent we've been looking at, and the trigon, we're familiar with and the circle, unpainted negative circle. So those are what are used where form lines come together or overlap and so on in order to define the outside edges of the form line shapes. And it can really be either, often you'd, might, you might want to be inclined to put that crescent right on the outside edge of the ovoid and it would look like that. But just as easily, is this too low for people in the back? Yeah, let's put the light on. Good idea. Can you flip the light on, sir, right by you? And I'll, I'll, I'll do it up higher. It's, there's a smear on this board that makes the chalk not stick right here, but I'll try to avoid it. And I'll take that off with the wet ring for now. But I'll keep the dry one down here. So I'll put another one next to it, a little smaller. And the U shape. and the same form line. But on this one, let's put the crescent on the outside edge of the U shape. That would look like that. So here's the same two forms, but instead of following the outside edge of the ovoid, we're following the outside edge of the U shape. And another way of dealing with that would be, well, there's a couple. And one would be to use a circle. <coughs> and a circle would just sit there like that. So that doesn't define the edge of the ovoid or the U shape, but it does break up that space and cause the form lines to go from wide to very thin as they go around the, as they work around that circle. And when you have lines that do that, like here where this tapers down to nothing and this side tapers down to nothing where it meets the ovoid and the same here, that's what gives the design uh, strength and tension. So the, the width of the lines and the, the strength of the curves is the strength element, just one second, and where those lines taper down to from very thick to very thin is what gives it tension. So you're, you're working between strength and tension and, and it makes a much more 
that's what makes them visually interesting. Go ahead, your question. Uh huh. How would you measure it? Um, would, you, would you take a K measure and measure, or a um, salt I? What are you measuring, if you, if you don't mind my asking? For, for a design. Start about that. So where would you start, in other words? Out in thirds, you know, when you're doing. Um. Well. Because I noticed, well, you've done it so many years, but then if you're just starting out, you know, how do you? You know, take the measurements and measure the same. Or I know they do half, and then they then they draw the other half. I, I see what you get at. So, so the, what I think what you're talking about though is mainly applies to reproducing a design on a specific project. Yeah, but I meant the because out yeah, I see what you're saying. Um. I would say that in the compositional stage, you don't worry about measurement, mm -hmm. like with a tape measure. Um, but you'd be more concerned about the overall sense of balance of the forms and the design. And that's something you have to work out in the compositional stage. And then when you're applying it to a particular space, then you might use measurement to make sure it's coming out with the same proportion. But um, to start, and, and we'll, we'll have examples of that. We'll work them out here, and, and on, I'll challenge you to work them out on your paper as well. Um, we'll start with a blank space, but we'll define a space, and then fill it with design. And we're, we're not going to use any measurement. It'll all be eyeball. So. But right now, I, I just want to look at these kind of junctures and stuff like that. So, um, so now this form line, instead of just going around the ovoid continuously and up and down the U shape, they're now flowing together. So now this line comes here and goes down here and around the ovoid and then comes up here, fans out and connects to the corner of the U shape. And we've got this shape this direction going on here, this direction going on here. So now what if we took um, what if we took this U shape and made it a different size than the ovoid? What if we brought that line, the inside edge of the U shape way up like that? And then this line, the outside edge of the U shape would be up here. And this is actually what we saw on the back of that helmet, in fact, where there is round, but there's an ovoid here and an ovoid over here, and then they met in the middle. So we could handle this in some different ways. One way would be, probably the most likely one, would be to have the U form come right down to here, and then the ovoid would turn in its usual direction, but taper down to nothing, like that. So now, in effect, the U-shape has overlapped the ovoid again, because now the leg of the U-shape comes down here and turns like that. So now that's the corner of the ovoid, but it's actually the bottom of the U-shape, see? And then the ovoid itself sort of um, bows to the U-shape and, and tapers down to nothing right here. So now we've got a line that goes around there and it's almost like a spiral comes around and stops here. So that's one way that could handle that. If, if for some reason we wanted this curve to continue this way, we could do that. And then by widening that line up a little bit and making a, what I like to call a ligature, in other words, it's just a it's just a, a little form line that gets wider in the middle, and it's often it can be used um, in a lot of different places. But what it does is it creates a positive way of connecting the design, and it leaves an unpainted trigon in between these three lines. 
So this is solid painted line coming down here. This is gets wider in the middle and tapers out. And this line comes around here and tapers down like that. And it leaves the trigon in the middle. So that now we've used all three of those little transitional devices, circle, crescent, and the trigon. So then that, that's the basics of that idea. And another way that you see it applied real commonly in the design work And I'll use the example of um, box and chest designs. Dry it again. Say where, um, and I'll just do partial ones. Say this is part of the the main head of a chest, and that's another reason I like to call the the ovoid the grandmother of designs because. Well, for one thing, because it's a matrilineal cultural culture, right? So I don't call it the father of designs. It's the grandmother. And um, not only does it relate to all the other forms, but like um, a lot of times the, the whole head of a creature will be, even though it's made up of a lot of different form lines, it, it describes an ovoid itself. So it's a, it's a shape that keeps repeating itself all through the design, either in a complete form or partial forms. So then a lot of times on, um, say this might be the corner of, I'll make it a little wider, this might be the corner over here of the, the space, the side of the space. Here's the corner of the chest like this. So we, we, and I have to say I wouldn't start by drawing that line ordinarily, but, and a lot of times there's an ovoid up here in this other corner. So th this is a, at any rate, this is a form line coming around this way, then the bottom going like that. And in order to attach, put an ovoid up in this corner, well, you can, if you draw the outside edge and you think about that, you might put the ovoid here like this, then you'd put the inside edge here, and then you'd have a U-shape come out this way or, or whatever, see? And then there might be something else going in this way. But what if instead you brought this line, this form line here, instead of leaving it basically separate from this, a lot of times in this position you'll see this will drop down. And if you, if you think from the outside edge, you might not even conceive that happening or, or be able to anticipate it, but if you work if you think from the inside edge, it becomes very natural then to go about that differently and to not draw the outside edge first, but to draw the inside edge so that that ovoid sits right on the other form line. Now you think, well, that's just the same thing, but it's not because the outside edge of it is now here and right here it'll taper down to nothing. And on this side, it would come around like that and then taper down to nothing. So then this ovoid, the bottom of this ovoid form line and the top of this actually overlap. And sometimes it's like a partial overlap, sometimes it's complete where the, the actual hollow unpainted area within that ovoid goes right to the outside line of the other form line. And this is really very common. And then there are a lot of times there'll be another form down here like this, and it, it might come over this way. And then there'd be a, we'll make that outside line, we'll put a U-shape here, and we might put a circle or a crescent here to mark the outside edge of that U-shape. and the corner of it would be there, so that might end up being just a little crescent there as well. So then this ends up being like the leg of a U-shape, but it's not complete. It just comes over to here. And then there, in this space, there'll often be 
a, a secondary element. So if, if the main primary form lines, the initial form lines you put down to create the network of the design are black, then what goes in this spaces would be red, right? So uh, Holm called that primary, these lines that connect over the whole space as primary, and the spaces in between them he decided to call secondary. And so you can't, you don't have these until you have all the others, right? So primary, secondary. And then he looked at the design areas that are, in terms of color, that are carved out and painted blue-green, he called those tertiary. So it's primary, secondary, tertiary, meaning third. Anyway, uh, I, I, I'll use primary and secondary, and I, I just call those carved out areas and whatnot. And he'll call those, those little, what I call a fine line, he'll call a tertiary line. And that's okay, I, it works, it all works. He, he hates the word fine line. <laughs> so I try not to use it in his presence. But uh, I, I see some limitations in tertiary line because those little skinny lines end up in places that aren't technically what he would describe as tertiary. Um, and so it seems confusing to me to, to, to not call it that. And also I like to emphasize these like opposites, like to me the ovoid is the opposite of the U-shape and the fine line is the opposite of a form line and so on like that. And these opposites work together to create the strength and tension and so on in the design. So that if you make a, a design and we could use the, those feather designs of Robert Davidson as an example, there are no fine lines in there and consequently it ends up looking a little uh, a little flat. And if you add in those little fine lines, it not only presents more detail, but it almost gives a kind of depth to the design. And that's partly because of, I think, the way that convention of those little fine lines, like the fine line around the inner ovoid and so on, those developed, I think, from the way designs would have been carved. And then in a painted design, they were imitating the edges of the carved areas and doing it with a painted fine line. That's just my little theory. So anyway, I'm talking about overlapping and that's, that's what I'm talking about. So um, let's forge on into these pictures then. Yeah. And this is just a, a little e example of, of, it's a design of nothing but it's a collection of form lines that I put together uh, in order to illustrate this business of overlapping and whatnot because sometimes we'll look at a design and, and you don't really consider what's going on in there and, and until you start looking at individual elements. So uh, in creating this design, I probably drew the outside edge of it to start with. And then I put, the first thing I drew was the inside edge of this line right here. This is the, sort of the main ovoid, the biggest at least, ovoid in this whole thing. And drew the inside edge. Now you can see that the outside edge is not only broken up here and there, it's completely crossed over here. So if I drew the outside edge to start with, I'd have some, I'd have part of these crescents there, but I'd have to erase it here. And where, if that, where the line crossed painted lines like here, I'd have to erase it there as well. So by starting on the inside edge of these forms, you don't have to deal with that. See? So you can make changes to the outside edge at will, sort of wherever you want. Like adding this ovoid here that overlaps right over it. So, so this ovoid is there, and then drew the inside edge of this one, and then brought the form line down around it, and that, I also drew the inside edge of this U-shape here. So where's the outside edge of that U-shape? Well, 
it starts here, but then it becomes this ovoid. It would come up into here somewhere and then come down over here, but it doesn't because it's been overlapped by this ovoid. So again, drawing just the inside edge of the U-shape, I didn't have to worry about erasing any lines and stuff. So I could do this with the pen or a paintbrush and not have to erase anything, see? And I can build design from one inside edge to another and keep building until an entire space is full. And I didn't have to draw any pencil lines. I didn't have to mess around with that. I could do it all with a paintbrush. And I think that's how they did it. They started with a paintbrush and worked on from there, yeah. Today, uh, penciling with charcoal or anything like that before painting the uh, I, I don't know that, that there's any evidence of that, but there is evidence of thin, like a paint stick, making a very thin painted line. Oh, okay. And guess where it is? It's on the inside edge of the ovoid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, when it's yeah. there. Yeah. How about uh, Just, I'm sorry, Donald. Yeah. From what I've seen, uh, I think they use the marring action when you look at the paintbrushes. Uh huh. They're sharp on one end, so when they went around the template, uh, you can see, and sometimes uh, when, when, when it mars the wood, it also oh, keeps see. it from uh, bleeding. Oh, uh huh. So that's on the bedroom box. Oh, I don't uh -huh. know anything else. Uh huh. So, anyway, then. So in order to create this design, having, having put that there, this here, and that inside edge there, then I could draw this crescent in here on the outside edge of the ovoid, because you need to know where that outside edge is in order for it to be a form line. And so there's that, and then place this inside edge right there so that it's actually touching the outside edge of this one so that the form line of it comes around and tapers down to nothing and so on like that. And then the inside edge of this U shape, well, where's the outside edge of it? Well, it's down here somewhere, see? But it's all been overlapped by this other stuff. But when it comes to putting the secondary in, then you'd put your red secondary forms in here and red secondary forms in here and red secondary forms in here, and then you'd put your inner ovoids in here and so on. But to create that initial web of the design, it makes, um, it makes a lot of sense, and I think it was the way the old times did it, to work from the inside edges of these forms. So uh, another illustration of that is this somewhat more complete design. Uh, it's just the primary form lines, obviously. There's no, there's no red, there's no fine lines, there's no detail, but again, all the form lines in this thing, pretty much, have been overlapped by one adjacent line to it or another. So, in composing this, a, if this was, say, a box drum or something like that, and you wanted to paint that design on there, uh, you might make some kind of mark to indicate a, a general center line. And then you'd put your template down here for the eye socket and, draw, and use your little paint stick to trace around it or a brush, whichever. And you make that line. And then you take the same template over here and you would measure uh, say from the corner down to here, roughly, and here, so that you had the, and here and here, so you had the same angle, you're the same distance from the outside edge, and then you'd trace that inside edge of that form line right there. And then you can take your brush and carry on some of these other lines. Like if you decide, okay, I'm going to put the mouth here, I want it to come back like this. But you might start by putting this ovoid here. And then that would give you, you'd know where this outside edge would be and that's where this would stop. And then you think, okay, well, I've got my eye sockets. 
I need to span that space. So I'm going to draw the outside edge of this one and this line coming across to here and then the outside edge of this one and that will give me that space. Then I draw the inside edge of this U shape which creates the outside edge of this ovoid. And then I have this line and I have this line. I just need to define the outside edge of this form line so I put that crescent right there. And it's those concepts that when people see this work kind of work for the first time and try to reproduce it, that's what they don't always get, right? And so you see these crescents in the wrong place and they're not defining the edges of form line. They're just kind of where they thought they were supposed to go. So they might stick it over here somewhere, you know, or whatever. Um, but if you really understand the form line system, you know where to put those to create the outside edges, to define them. So then, um, I, this is like a little ligature. There often is just that across here. But because I decided to put these ovoids in the mouth, then I would I put each one here, inside edge, and then I would draw the inside edge of this U shape on the outside edge of that ovoid, come up like that, and then draw the bottom of the mouth coming across here to meet up with this line, create that little ligature across there, and then um, that create this little arc and then putting in the crescents here defines the edges of the ovoid form line here. And then this is a form just hanging there. It's like an eye. You see this sometimes in the old work. So there's an ovoid that doesn't touch this line. It's, it's a solid positive, not a negative ovoid. So we're drawing the outside edge of it. And it sits there and then the U shape conforms to the, like the shape of an eyelid. It's usually in a secondary form with a black eye, but you do see this in the old stuff. And then in creating this space, I probably started with the inside edge of this U shape here. And then I decided to put this ovoid right here. And the inside edge of it is right on the outside edge of this that was already there, see? So we just draw that there. And then it's like what we did over there. Here's the ovoid and the U shape. In this case, I drew the outside edge of the U shape and then the, tr the ligature, the outside edge of the ovoid tapering down, leaves the crescent, I mean the trigon there. And then, um, so I had this and then this element and decided to come up the outside edge of that ovoid all the way up to here and down and then the end of the outside edge of that U shape is up here and it turns out this way and I already have this crescent here and that creates that space and then this U shape is really secondary. It should probably technically be, technically be in the opposite color but even that is a U shape that's been overlapped by an ovoid because you could put crescents here at the outside edge of the ovoid you could put a circle there, um, but it's a ovoid form line that has U-shaped legs, or it's a U-shape with a broad end that has a negative ovoid that pierces it. Either way you look at it, it's the same thing. It's an ovoid overlapping a U-shape. So uh, that principle shows up again and again in design, and we'll look at some examples here. And this, all, this actually illustrates more than one thing. Um, this is a little panel I did for the State Museum to illustrate the steps in creating a design. Uh, there's an illustration in, um, where is that? I think it's in the Arts of the Raven catalog that Holm did that um, is similar to that. I mean, it's a different design completely, but it illustrates the same steps. So this is four panels. There's one here, there's another joint here, and another one here. And in fact, these are actually separate panels that were hinged together so that that thing that's about that size actually will fold up into a smaller space so they can 
transported to schools and whatnot in a little suitcase. But it's as if it was, say, a, a, a long chest, the front of a chest or something like that, or a panel or a big screen or whatever it could be. But the first thing you do is illustrated here on the left panel. You put in all the black primary form lines across the whole thing. But it would end up, the whole thing would look like this, which is like the last design in that there's just primary form lines. But I think anybody in their right mind would also put in these little fine lines and the inner ovoids at that same stage. Now there's another thing that I found um, that I was doing it backwards all the time. And that is that I would put, I'd draw my form line ovoid and then I'd put my inner ovoid there and with nice proportions around it that I liked for the carved out space. And then I hated those little fine lines. Well, number one, they're hard to paint. And not only that, but when I put it around the inner ovoid, it, as often as not, it destroyed the nice proportions that, I mean, they're still not that bad, but I don't like that as much as I liked what I drew at first. So then it dawned on me, paint the fine line or draw the fine line first. So that's what I do anymore. I'll go back to the first line I drew. And so that, well now, that's going to be the fine line, see? Then, when I put the inner ovoid inside of it, it doesn't destroy the proportions or the relationship of the inner to the outer, and I'm much happier with the results. Not only that, it's easier to paint that little fine line before the inner ovoid is there. Because when you're trying to follow a certain distance all the way around that shape, it's a little, it puts a little pressure on you and it's a little harder to do, see? But if you never mind that and you just paint the fine line first by rotating the brush and stuff, you can be real free about it and you lay that fine line in there. And if it's not exactly perfect, it won't really matter. And then when you come to put the inside one in it, it's really easy to, with even a bigger brush, right, to come up and just paint that the exact distance you want it to be from the fine line and then fill in the inner space, you know. So it's much easier to do it in that progression. Paint the fine line first or even draw it first and then draw the inner one. It's much simpler. It's just a suggestion that I'll make. So that's, um, so here I painted these fine lines first and then I put the inner ovoids in. So then the next step, once you have all the primary form lines right, is you put in the secondary. So all these spaces, which in this panel I left plain, would be filled in as well, like you, like you see them over here with the red. So in this panel, the red has been painted in there. And um, so you have the black primary, in this case, and the red secondary. Now it can be the opposite, and we'll see examples shortly, where the primary form lines are red, and the secondary ones are black. You just reverse these roles. So this would all be red, and these areas would be black. So it works both ways. And then in, in Holmes' book, he goes on to describe if there's a black form line shape within a red complex like these two, he calls those subsecondary. And that's fine. That's just another reversal of the color system. So it goes from black to red, back to black again. Or it could go from red to black, and then this would be red again. It'd be the opposite. Uh, but all pretty much 100% of the time, 99 point something percent of the time, the inner, maybe not quite that high, the inner ovoids, no matter what color the primary form lines are, are black. Although you do occasionally see red inner ovoids and little red fine lines around them. But that's usually in a case 
where it was kind of pressured to be that way, where the artist might decide there's just too much black in this one part of this design, and I want to balance the red better, I'm going to make these inner ovoids red, and they do that. But the general principle is that the uh, main stuff is one color and the secondary is another color. And the inner ovoids are always black and the fine lines are on them. Um, and generally speaking, in any painted design, no matter what color is the primary, generally speaking, the fine lines, that is to say, not beyond the ones that are around the inner ovoids, but like here, Here's a U-shape that's just uh, defined by a fine line around it. There's fine lines in this corner here and so on. Usually they're black, whether the primary is black or red. Usually the fine lines are black. But sometimes you see red ones. And there was a couple of artists, I think Haida artists, in the 19th century at least, a couple, who did something different. And I did it here because I liked what they did. And that is that where the fine line was next to a black form line, it's red, and where it's next to a red form line, it's black. So this little shape that fits in the corner here, ha one side of it's a red fine line, the other side of it's black. Same with this one here. And again, that's just something that I got from the work of a couple of 19th century Haida painters who did it that way. And I thought, wow, that's really neat. But you seldom see that. And um, that's because the, most of the time, all the fine lines would be black, even in this area where they're, the, it's like a red primary, see? And was that only in Haida that you've seen that? Well, it was, I believe they were Haida paintings. Uh, yeah. Not in Clinkett, though? I don't think I have, but it's not to say they're not there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, now the red secondary is painted in, so then you carve everything that isn't painted. So this panel, it's a little hard to see in this picture. The light isn't as good as it could be. But all these unpainted areas are carved out. So we, we deliberately left spaces between the red and the black. They don't touch. And then we carve that space. And we carve this space. All these spaces are carved out where there's no paint. So without the paint there, you wouldn't know where to carve. And that's the order it was traditionally done in, rather than laying out the design in pencil, carving the design, and then painting the red and the black. They didn't do it that way. It, it, if, they did, if there was no paint, they did it that way. They laid it out, carved it. But if it was painted, they painted it first and carved it second. And you can tell that's the case because you can, it's actually not uncommon it's not everywhere, but here and there you see it. You'll find a design that, like a chest or something, and, and everything's carved, but you see that they forgot this one little crescent here. They forgot to carve it. And if it was paint, if it was carved first, they would never have overlooked it. But because it's painted first, it's really pretty easy to forget. I've done it myself. Years later, I notice, oh, geez, I forgot to carve that thing. <laughs> And, and there are other indications that that, that was the, the progression. Paint first and then carve. So then the, all, the, all the unpainted areas are carved out and certain of the carved out areas get painted blue-green. So like around oh, inner ovoids or eyes, here's the inner ovoid eye, inner ovoid here, within U-shapes, like this space here that is what Bill would call a tertiary U-shape primary black, secondary red, tertiary blue. And because those always have a fine line around them, that's why he calls those tertiary lines. And so this area, this one is between a red secondary and a black primary, but it's hollowed out and painted blue. So it's like a tertiary U shape here. And there's a tertiary line at the edge of it. And then here, I, that was a, um, you know, the little spiral comes around that ovoid shape, and I put a red fine line around the edge of it, hollowed out between it, and then painted that blue and green too. So there ends up being mostly black, little bits of red here and there, 
and, and then bits of blue here and there as well. So then the whole thing would end up looking like this, right? And that's what we're used to seeing as the finished product. But that's the steps that are taken to get there is paint all the black, then compose and apply the red, carve the unpainted areas, and then certain of the carved out areas get painted blue-green. So this is intended to be like a Gunakadate sea monster type thing. So we've got the eye socket and a big toothy mouth and a pectoral fin down here. And, um, and then I, this is some wild crazy part of the monster's head and ends up down here to fill that space over here. And you can see there's a lot of overlap in this and it's typical kinds of overlap that you see in this kind of a design composition. So that here, this ovoid, the outside edge of it isn't there. I mean, it's, it's the top of the mouth or the, this edge at the bottom of the mouth here. And it's the outside here, but it doesn't exist over here. So I drew the inside edge of that ovoid right on the outside edge of that form line. And then brought the U-shape over here. This one's the same way. I drew the inside edge of that right against the outside edge of that one and then complete the form line around it. This U-shape, the inside edge is right on, on this side, right on the outside edge of that form line, and it connects that way, and then the spiral coming along below it. And then here, the, this, is, this is something that can be done either way. Like if you painted it solid like that, you could then V-cut out that area but I find I don't really like, some people do that. I don't like to do it because then when you go to carve that out, sometimes the action of your knife will <laughs> catch that paint and cause it to sort of bend over the edge and it looks funny. So more commonly, I would paint that relief in there, that unpainted ovoid, paint it like that, and then carve out the unpainted space. It's actually, you can get a cleaner line doing that because you're not actually carving through the paint. You're just carving right at the edge of it. So anyway, um, so what if I was going to, in composing a design like that and painting it with a paintbrush, what would I do? I'd start with the eye ovoid here, and that's where you take that little paint stick and trace around, maybe you trace around a template if you're trying to match these two. And um, that's where you see that line. You see it, they might use a black line and they'll paint it all the way around that inside edge right there. And it'll still show up over here, sometimes even when they paint the red. They'll paint the red right over that line. Sometimes you'll see the remnants of that line th either through the paint by the, the, the thickness of it painted over, or you'll actually see the edge of the black. But you realize that they had drawn that inside edge first. And then, after you have that, well, the, to me, the next most important form is the mouth. So we know where the inside edge of that is. We drop down the thickness of the form line to here and draw the mouth, how I want it to be, from underneath this ovoid to underneath this one. Somewhere in that middle third is the end of the mouth. Although that can differ a lot too, depending on the design. But so then I would draw the mouth, inside edge of the mouth, and then I might progress here to the middle. I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. I could make that ligature across there and then paint up this square U shape across and down. And then I'd put in these U shapes at the top with the eye in them. So the there, the, the top of this U-shape just comes straight across and paint in that ovoid and then the eyelid shape around it. And then I've got the whole head for positive primary form lines painted. Then I'd put the inside edge of this form line there. I'd create this rectangular body space, put the crescent there, crescent there. Then I'd extend, I'd put the inside edge of this U-shape there and then complete it. Then I'd go up here to the corner, 
put the inside edge of that ovoid there and then paint and then the inside edge of that u-shape there and then that would give me the outside edge of this one and then I'd look up here and think okay what do I want to do I want to put a big crescent there to mark the outside edge of that original form line that we started with but we started with the inside edge of it and then I would put the crescent in the corner and because of, that's a big space I'd bring that little ligature like the leg of a u-shape over there another crescent there and then this ovoid right on the outside edge of that form line and then the form line around it and the crescent to mark the outside edge of that and bingo it's done and that's all with a paintbrush and I haven't had to erase anything and I think that's how they did it shape by shape by shape building and building and they didn't always use templates and they didn't always measure real precisely so that a lot of times you look at a painted chest design and you'll be able to detect little asymmetries and they don't really matter big deal you know uh, I like to tell people that symmetry is overrated because it's not really a quality that seemed to be of huge concern it was, it was concern but not huge and if there were little differences they didn't really care or seem to care and they often or at least in some cases would make changes from one side to the other there might be a, a certain kind of a secondary area here and the one over here might be completely different so deliberately asymmetrical um, anyway that's that's another principle so let's keep going here this is two panels also done for the State Museum that illustrate the same thing so I, I won't go too far with this but here's the just primary here's adding in the secondary of course that would be everywhere not just there but left this at primary here's painted primary and added in the secondary and then carved the unpainted areas and then this one has the certain carved out areas painted blue green so this is the completed version and um, again to compose this I'd start with the inside edge of this and then I'd and that one and then I'd put the mouth inside edge of the mouth and then I'd start building the junctures from there like this ligature there and that arch up there and and then putting this ovoid right against the outside edge of this one so that the outside edge of that ovoid is overlapped completely by this one and then I'd put the inside edge of that u-shape there put the outside edge there crescent crescent trigon on this side to use the ligature thing there and so here the the trigon isn't this is an interesting point in a way so here I've got here's the curve of the eye socket coming down like this and then the edge of the field is right here and the other ovoid sits right here so it's sitting right on the form line the outside edge of it would technically be right there but you could put that trigon so it splits this space right in half and some artists would do that and that's fine but it's not really marking the outside edge of the ovoid there because the outside edge of the ovoid actually comes over to here see and in a way it gets a little more kind of muddy looking and I, I find that I'm happier if the point of the trigon really follows the completely the outside edge of the ovoid so instead of being in the center of that space it's clear over on one edge so the ovoid form line is complete and the little ligature is what tapers out see because here the ligature tapers out this way but it doesn't this way it keeps going up into here and to me I'm, I'm happier it's your own decision to make don't worry about it but I'm happier if the full outside edge of the ovoid form line is there and it's the ligature that tapers out um, but that's a minor point you, uh, have you done the same same exact design and changed the format the form line you know? 
Right. Well, if you change the farm line, it's not the same exact well, design, is it? Well, I mean, you have the same U shape. Oh, well, you mean the secondary lines, stuff? But, but moving the form line, you know, I mean, uh, like you're saying with that trigon, you could have uh -huh. moved it. You moved it down instead of kept it up. Uh huh. But like you could. <clears throat> you were talking about another another one that uh, got you thinking. Yeah. Well, um, I've sometimes done similar designs and then changed the details, but I find that I'm happier if I design something completely different. Well, I was just thinking about like a teaching tool, you know. Oh, uh huh. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that can be a, a real strong illustration, yeah. Uh, so one other curious thing about this design that it's not entirely noticeable at first is that usually this form line that forms the mouth, you could say comes up around here and down here and then comes across here to form the lower jaw. And then the trigon sits in the space. But here the lower jaw is continuous right there, and this comes down below it and actually turns into the foot. So it's as if this is the arm of the creature, and this is the foot. But here the foot has overlapped the lower jaw, or as it would exist usually, in this corner. And that's just a way of conserving space. So instead of having repetitive lines, you have the lines come together and they they actually uh, share space. Another principle that we'll encounter in looking at this old work is that usually speaking, like these eyes here are kind of big and solid black in relation to everything else. And usually you could say that the thickest line on it should be the top of the main eye socket. And everything else should be s smaller than that to be in traditional proportion. And, and that's usually the case. But here, these eyes are bigger and blacker than that is, see? So most of the time, an artist that created that situation, and I would myself ordinarily, you'd put some kind of a relief here to break up, uh, that is to say, an unpainted area in here to break up that space. So let's look at some of those possibilities of how to do that. And one of them, I'll just make several ovoids here. I should probably get rid of those others a little better. It seems to dry relatively fast, so. Otherwise the chalk wouldn't stick. Okay, ovoid number one. So why don't you just do some of these on your note page there. Two, three. I'll put another one over here, four. So the simplest version of that that you see is when um, and this is, there's this just the inner ovoid, there's no, I'm not gonna bother with the fine line here. The simplest one that you see is they'll just put a crescent across the ovoid, like that. Um, sometimes right in the middle, sometimes lower than the middle, so the upper form line, so to speak, is thicker than the lower one. But that's pretty common and very rarely, but you do see it, is occasionally, uh, I'm, and I'm speaking of the historic tradition as far as occasionally goes, but a, a, an artist will break that up with a trigon right through the ovoid like that. That's much more common today than it was 100 years ago or more, but you do find it occasionally in the old work. And the other way, which is probably really the most common, is to put a, a negative ovoid in there. That is to say, a, an ovoid-shaped relief. So we start by 
opening that all the way up so that this would be a, like a solid black painted ovoid and we'll just not paint the inside part and then we'll put another o positive ovoid inside that negative one unpainted one so that there's a, a gap all the way around and that's actually the most common and then this would be painted solid. So you've got that ovoid shaped relief and that's the most common one of all these is this ovoid shaped relief. And that's especially common in the 18th century and before. And then later, you don't much see this in the earlier work, but you see it in the 19th century work and that, that inside ovoid using the principle of non-concentricity that floats up till it actually touches the upper line up here and so that the arc of it the of the top then actually touches the the space up here so that now that's not a continuous unpainted space but you get this what uh, Holm called a C-shaped relief. So, but it's formed by positive, negative, positive ovoid, and the inner positive ovoid floats up so high that it actually touches the top. And that might be wider up there in most cases. I'll open that up a little bit. But the idea is that And we've all seen that, but that in the in the older work, that's less common than this is. So then, what about if that's still not enough relief, so to speak? You still want to break that up more. Then they end up going to um, multiple shapes within that, and we end up with what is often has been called the salmon trout head. But that starts in a very simple form as well. So other than putting another ovoid inside like this, they would put another ovoid inside. I'll, I'll do the inside edge of it right here little slight tilt on it, I might come close to or slightly beyond the middle. So that's the inside edge of an ovoid. So this is the positive painted part out here. And the outside edge of that ovoid, as we can remember, would be right there, right? So they would and then that leaves what? It leaves a kind of a U-shaped space over here. It's got two round corners and two pointed corners, which is exactly what a U-shape is. So we've got two round corners here and here and two pointed corners here and here. So we we just mark the outside edge there, but only to there and there, and then put the inside edge of the U-shape that goes along with it. So that, and you do see this, just a one, a simple ovoid and U-shape way of developing an inner ovoid. And then we would put our fine line inside here, another ovoid shape, and the inner, inner ovoid within that, that's painted solid. And then we've got a uh, U-shaped space over here, and commonly you'd just follow that with a fine line of V-cuts width away all the way and touch it in the corner, and then the bottom of that would just be a crescent-like space that opens up like that. So now we've got fine line here, fine line here, and we've just outlined the what would be hollowed out and painted blue-green here. This would be hollowed out and painted blue-green around the ovoid as well. So that's like the simplest form of an elaborated inner ovoid. 
Now that, that name salmon trout is interesting because as I gather it, that's the, that Emmons um, got a term from somebody, uh, either, I don't know, Sitka or Tlekwan, wherever he did most of his work. And they called that, that shape where there's a, a profile face within a, an eye, they used a word, Tlingit word, that translated as, at least Emmons translated as, looks like the head of a salmon trout. And so people call it a salmon trout head. Now, I don't know what a salmon trout is. Is that a steelhead or what is that, do you think? But what he's getting, it looks like the head of a fish. But that's not the same as calling it a fish head, is it, really? So um, it's, a, it's a handy term, and it's one that's easy to use. And it is loosely derived from a traditional uh, word. And there's really nothing better to replace it with, so we keep calling them salmon trout head. Elaborated inner ovoid is kind of dry somehow. <coughs> but anyway, so then what if we want to elaborate that even more? Because that's not the, the most typical form we see that in. But you do see it occasionally. Uh, Charles Edenshaw, a famous Haida painter, used that a lot. When he wanted a little bit of elaboration, but not too much. So the next sort of step would be to introduce the, con the, we've got like an eye socket and a snout there. You could see that as an eye socket and a snout. It's starting to suggest that already, which is part of the sort of the power of these forms. But what if we want more than that? What if we want to introduce a mouth? In that case, we've got the inner ovoid already, so we're going to put the eye socket in that corner like that and we're going to place it in such a way that it's got more tilt to it than the ovoid that it's in. So that's the inside edge of this ovoid form line. In that case, the outside edge of it is actually there on that dotted line, see? So that we've tilted that a little bit and we've deliberately placed it at this point in the corner so that the resulting form line around it will have the right proportions. Thickest on the top, thinner on the, thinnest on the bottom, and a little bit somewhere in between on each side. So that's why in placing that inner edge to create the form line, you have to put it in the right spot. So it's that far down from the top and that far over from the side. So then that leaves space between the bottom of that ovoid form line and the bottom of the ovoid. So then if we followed that outer edge of that form line right parallel to the bottom of the tilted ovoid, we just keep going straight out until we get close to the other side then turn up to meet that other corner. And then when we put our U-shaped snout in there, we do the same thing we did before, put the inside edge of the U-shape there. Then we've got the eye socket and the snout. We also have an open mouth. So we make final that out by putting the other edge of the mouth opening there and continuing this form line across the bottom to create the lower jaw. Now that, that's a simple form of that because it doesn't include a cheek design, which uh, the most common form of it does. But this is another form that you see often enough. And we can put an inner ovoid in here, and in this case we'll put an eyelid line around it. And in that case, it's actually easier and most successful probably to draw the eye ovoid first and then put the eyelid line around it, even though it's the fine line because it's not quite the same problem as putting the fine line all the way around like that. So somewhere
somewhere about if you divided this up into sort of like thirds from top to bottom, one third, one third, one third, then the point of the eyelid would sort of run through that somewhere in that, I'm a little too close to the edge here, but somewhere in that bottom area, see the bottom third. So that's just an imaginary line that you draw across there. So then the eyelid line comes up toward the top and arches across the top of the ovoid and goes down the other side. The other side of it comes toward the ovoid and drops down to parallel the outside edge of it, then goes up and goes the other way. But the points of it are somewhere down in here, not like up as high as halfway. It looks funny if they're up that high, they're lower. And some artists, not all, would put the eye ovoid closer to the top of the eyelid than to the bottom because it's that upward floating thing again. So we'll put the eyelid around this one. Paint the eye black. And then we'll put our fine line in the U shape and we'll follow the upper edge of it all the way around just a V cut's width away. You don't want to leave any more space there than a V cut at this in this layout anyway. Otherwise you get too big or either too wide or too deep of a cut, place to cut out there. And we could put a trigon coming into that, a fine line split <coughs> like that. And then if we want, they're often there, not all the time, we'll just put a fine line down here parallel to one edge or the other so that there's something in the mouth. And so then that's sort of the next step in the elaboration of this um, salmon trout head thing. So if we want to, but again, that's not as common as some other form. So let's look at, let's take it another step farther to the, to the more common form. So in that case, we'll put, start with the eye socket again We'll put it up here in the upper corner, but we'll leave it up quite a bit higher this time. It'll still be tilted a little bit. Might still come across to the center or slightly beyond it, but we're gonna leave more space down here. So now the outside edge of that ovoid form line, and it's important to remember this. I mean, I don't always draw that line there. I'm doing that just to explain what I'm doing, but you need to remember where the outside edge of that line is. Otherwise, it won't be a form line when you're done. So now the bottom of it is quite a bit higher than this. So now if we want to put a mouth line in there, we'll do the same thing. We'll start somewhere in the middle of the eye socket and can extend the line parallel to the bottom of that across to the other side and turn it up as it meets the other side like that. But instead of going back into the lower corner like we did in this example, we're going to turn that down this way. Like that. And then when we put the outside edge of the ovoid in there, we end up with this little tapering point that comes down like that. And then instead of the ovoid form line, the outside edge of it following the ovoid, this is again why you don't draw the outside edge first, or it's a good idea not to, is that that's actually gonna come from the inside edge parallel to the outside of the big ovoid and across the bottom and then up here and taper out where it meets that point. And then we'll go ahead and put the inside edge of this U-shape in here. So and then I'll shade those lines in so it's not so confusing.
Okay, so now that form line, you could say, well, it either starts here or starts here, goes around the eye socket, down to form the lower jaw, and across. So now we have not just two spaces defined by form lines, or three, eye socket, snout, and mouth, we've got four. We have the eye socket, the snout, the mouth, and what we would call the cheek design, because it's below the eye socket and behind the mouth, so we just call it the cheek. And there's where that inside edge of the line continues across, see? So then we'd put um, what is usually the case here is to have a U-shape that comes down and turns back up to there. So it's, it's a U-shape that has, well, let's see. I'll try to draw it right side up like that. It's a U-shape shaped like that. So that one leg of it comes straight down, the other leg of it turns out this way. So this is upside down. If you flip that over, that's what this is. See? I'm going to fix that corner. Now sometimes a painter will leave a lot more space below it and they'll make that U-shape narrower so there's more unpainted space over there but it's still the same construction. And in an inner ovoid, that would still usually be black, but sometimes it's painted red, and on a full design where this is not an inner ovoid, but it's part of a head, that, would, that part would be painted red because it's like a secondary U-shape in a way. So that's commonly painted red there. And then you'd go ahead and put your eye shape in there and your eyelid line. Like so. Now I've really exaggerated the upward floating in that one. And then we'll put a fine line in the U shape all the way around. V cuts width away from the black. And we'll put another trigon split in there. And then in the mouth, we got enough room, we'll put a fine line paralleling the top edge of V-cuts width away, trying to be. And then we'll put another one along the bottom and put a trigon split in that as well. So now that, the way that this is handled and the mouth is handled and the proportions of the cheek design vary a lot. But as far as the structure goes, that's the most common form of a elaborated inner ovoid. And it's all just to break up that space so that it's not solid black. Now it can also be used to introduce other imagery into the design. Instead of being kind of a generic face, you can actually make that look like something. Although you seldom see that in the old work, but it can be done and you occasionally see it. For example, if we took the snout in this other corner, and instead of turning the line up, if we turned it down like a eagle's beak, put a crescent along the edge of the U shape, we'd create something that looked more like an eagle's head, if that was useful to the design you're doing. And occasionally you see that, but um, not so very often. It's usually the sort of generic form. But this makes a real interesting little kind of a study. Um, if you want to just get, get used to design and composing within a space, this is a good way to do it. And I'll show you some example. Like for instance, if we took, um, I'll make this fairly big. This will be the same basic thing. It's a inner ovoid. And we'll construct, we'll put an eye socket over here. Same way we did before. A form line width away from the outer line. So we've got our form line here. But then 
I'm gonna put another ovoid out here and I'm gonna run the inside edge of it here and turn it like that so that the outside edge of it matches the outer curve of the inner ovoid. So then I'll, I'll follow that all the way around at this point just so you can see it there. Then what am I going to do with that? I'm going to take that mouth line from the bottom of the eye socket parallel to it right along the outside edge of that form line which we know is right there. I'm going to continue that across like we did before but I'm going to turn it up where it meets the outside edge of that ovoid form line and we can still create the U-shaped space between them by having this side of it come over and meet the same outside edge of this form line. So then we've got this space up here. What do we do? We put a crescent on the edge of the ovoid to open up some negative space there. And that closes that part of the web and then, well, what if, we, um, what if we bring the mouth clear back to here and then turn it forward and go parallel to the bottom and then taper out where it meets the corner of this ovoid over here? Can we get the light turned back on, I guess? I think it is on. Oh, that one, okay. Great. So then we could either put a circle or a crescent or a trigon over here. And in this case, I think I'll just put a crescent. We'll open that up. And then we'll shade in the lower jaw coming across <laughs> there. Then for this part, this side of this U shape, We've got really the outside edge of it here, so then I'll finish the inside edge in the usual way, just coming up like that. And then that will just taper out where it meets the other ovoid line. So there's a completely different internal structure, but it could still be an inner ovoid like any other where these would be found. So then we'd stick our eye in there Eyelid line, etc. Fine lines here. Maybe no trigon this time, just fine line all the way around the edge with a crescent at the base. And we'll just fine line the edge of this. And we'll put, um, we'll put a, almost a secondary U shape in here. All right. And we'll shade that part in. And then over here, we'll put the trigon split running this way. So, and, and you could sit here and do that one after the other for the rest of the time we got and never do two alike. You could change, change any little detail here, but you might still have an eye socket and you might still have a snout and you might still have a mouth. But they can be changed in any variety of ways. And that's the same as any other design, and you'd build any other design kind of the same way. And this is all the inner ovoid of the uh, Yeah, line, yeah, line. like a big eye type thing, yeah. But it's great fun, in fact, to do that. And, and when I was uh, working first, was a student at the University of Washington, I went there to take Bill Holmes' classes and, uh, and because the tuition was only $115 a quarter in those days. Um, it's a lot more than that now. I hate to think about it. But um, anyway, I, I wouldn't have gone anywhere else because that's where he was. And um, I'd, I'd known him for a few years at that point. In fact, he hired me to work at the Burke, so I'd, I'd go for $2 an hour. So I'd go... Uh, which was higher than the minimum wage in those days. Um, I'd go to his class and then 
hang out and, and work in the museum carving reproductions for their traveling study collections. But anyway, one of the things he had done during that time was whenever he was sitting in a meeting, he was a high school teacher, high school art teacher before that, up until 1967. And um, when he'd sit in a faculty meeting or in a concert or something like that, he'd sit and he'd doodle these little ovoids like this. Doodle, 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 doodle. And he saved all those little scraps. Of, he was on the back of a program or something like that, or a scrap of paper. And he'd saved all those in a heap. And then one day he'd just, he'd cut them all out. So they, they varied in size from this to this, you know. He cut them all out and stuck them on a piece of paper and then photocopied it. And he had page after page after page, somewhere I have a copy of it, of all these, there, there might have been 15 of them on a page, you know, or more, maybe 20, and uh, they'd all be different. And you could, and he kind of organized them so that ones that had round eye sockets were all on this page and so on like that. But there were hundreds of them on these sets of pages that were just this, over and over again, totally different structure. So if you, it's a great thing to do to stay in practice. Because if, if you don't practice visualizing like this, it's harder to do it. And if you keep practicing in between when you have to make a design, then when you, when you do have to make a design, it comes a lot easier. Because you know how it is, some days it just flows out of your pencil, you can't make a mistake. And other days you can't push it out of the pencil, it just won't come. So if you keep practicing, it makes it flow a little easier. Anyway, so just to keep trying different ones, and to use different ones. Don't use the same one all the time. What the heck, you know? Keep it interesting. So uh, let's spend a little bit of time. I don't want to shoot the hole. It's now 3.20 something, right? I'm still on down south time. No, it's two something. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look at this. Can we down the light there, uh, Robert or somebody? Uh, this is an illustration from the Arts of the Raven catalog, and that was a show in 1967 at the Vancouver Art Gallery that um, was curated by Bill Holm and Bill Reed and Wilson Duff. And it was a huge exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery, and, and I was like 16 at the time, and I went there th three or four times during the run of it, because there were things that I, you see in books for all the year, and then suddenly there they all were in person. So they did this catalog, and Bill did several illustrations, including one of those step-by-step -step things like we just looked at. But these are three different designs. Uh, obviously, each one is the head. Each Interesting, each of those heads is an ovoid shape, as well as being made up of ovoids and other forms. And they all have the same structure, one main form line that goes all the way around, dips in the middle between the eye sockets and so on like that. So, and then there, there's a separate line for the upper jaw, separate line for each nostril and the bridge of the nose is one line like. So that those, the structure is the same. The difference is in the detail, right? So, and in the size, this one is taken from, they're all actual old paintings from some object or another. This is from the breast of a raven rattle, so it's maybe only really that big. And this is from a chest, the main face on a on a hide a chest. So in fact actual fact it's about this big. And this is from uh, a hide a house front in Skidigat, and so it's thirty feet across. But the structure's all the same, which is kind of the point of it, that the structure doesn't get more detailed, the secondary areas get more detailed. So here on the top, the eyes, in order to keep that principle of the top form line being the thickest part, if that was solid black, it would disrupt that principle. So they put the ovoid shaped relief in there, and this is a 19th century work, they elevated the innermost one so that it touched at the top. So it's a discontinuous ovoid shaped relief. The cheek design here has some stuff going on. It's not just a simple red form. 
but it's got one form line like shape there, an echo of this one, then a crescent and a little tail that flips up to fill in the rest of the eye socket. And then the mouth is just teeth and tongue. But here, there was more room. If this was solid black, it would be way too much black. So, and even if he did that, it would be way too much black. So they broke it up into not a profile face like we've been doing, but a, a double eye face, a, a frontal face. So there, each half of that is like the profile face where the form line comes around dips down and then you have the cheek design that completes the eye socket and then the mouth but there's another one on the opposite side so it looks like a frontal face here then the cheek design is more elaborate has a secondary ovoid and a u-shaped legs there the u-shape overlapped by the ovoid and then the trigon bringing that little triangular shape up in there and there because that's not the edge of any other form line the trigon splits right up the middle of it and it makes the most sense for it to do that because the whole space tapers out anyway. And then again, just teeth and tongue. But down here, he put in the double eye form, but even then that wasn't enough. So he put a profile eye inside each one of those eyes where here it just had the ovoid shape relief. And if you look really close inside the eyes of those, no, I'm kidding now. <laughs> but you could do that if you had a small enough paintbrush. You could keep putting elaborated eyes in there. And here the cheek design is way more elaborate, although structurally it's not that much different from this. It's an ovoid at the end and U-shaped legs coming off it. But here there's a sub-secondary U-shape within that. And here's, a whole, here's the entrance to the house. There's a human figure there draped over that and then other form line stuff going on in the mouth. So, but it illustrates that the primary structure stays the same and the details become elaborated. So oh, this is not an old thing. This is a drum that I painted years ago for a friend of mine in Wrangell. But it shows some of that overlapping type stuff. And it's a little switch. So instead of black or red primary, I used the tertiary color for the primary. And I got that idea from my friend Joe David, who's a Tlaoquiat artist from um, Vancouver Island, but he works in the northern style as well. And he painted a drum that I saw one time. He showed me that he'd used the blue for the primary form lines and black secondary. I thought, wow, that looks great. I want to do it. So I tried it on this one. But here, so there's just the eagle's head and the wings and the secondary is sort of like the tail of the bird. So by overlapping the form line of the wing, the joint of the wing, right to the lower jaw and overlapping the other wing by putting the inside edge of the form line right against the outside edge of the head, that all looks like it's more tied together than it would if these were really separate and they just taper up in there and then the secondary form in the opposite color, in this case black, it's, it's as if this was a red form line and the black secondary and the black inner ovoids, but here it's blue instead. But uh, it shows some of those fine line things that I'm drawing over here where the fine line parallels the U-shaped space, same, same like this, and then the fine line split there, and again, that's just a V-cuts width away from the other form line, a V-cuts width away between the red and the, I mean, the blue and the black here and so on. Circle relief, crescent relief, you know, it shows all that stuff. So then we'll find some old things that have some of those same principles in them. I did this backwards. Um, that's, uh, I wanted to show it sideways, but not that one. I think there's another one here that. No, I forgot it. I ended up with the bum one again. Anyway, I have pictures of two of these house posts. Sorry. And uh, this one, unfortunately, I wanted it to be sideways, but I wanted the other house post because it has less rod in it. But anyway, um, these are from Tlaquan. They're in the Portland Art Museum now. 
And as I understand it, these represent dog salmon, is that right, Marsha? Yeah. I, I, the information they have with them is that they represent dog salmon. I always thought they were whales, but they're not. So, and I tipped it sideways so it was easier to see the whale, the, or the fish design itself. Turn it vertical and it gets a little harder to read as a dog salmon. But, so here's the head, the body, dorsal fin, pectoral fin, one of the body fins down here, and the tail. And this is a real, this is a probably a 18th century uh, carving. It's a spruce house post. Uh, wider at the top than it is at the bottom because this is the base of the tree up here. That's the top of the tree down there. And this dog salmon's carved in there. So we've got its older work. It's got the big massive form lines, the eye socket, snout, and a crescent at the corner of the eye socket form line and then the mouth coming across. U-shape for the pectoral fin coming back, and that's actually overlapping the form line of the body, so that that's the outside edge of that pectoral fin right there. And then he used this, um, like a S kind of a shape to represent ribs. Uh, the dorsal fin is a U-shape coming up that way. And then he used a little, is a really interesting little structure here with another U-shape going this way and a crescent there. And two form lines coming across here it makes another U-shape with fine line U-shapes within it. Then a big face in the ovoid in the tail carved like a mask. So these kind of faces I'll refer to as a mask-like face because like this, if you took that flat relief carving and bent it around a form, it would really be a mask. It'd be just like a mask. And the eyebrows and the mouth and the eyes are all separate. They're not made up of form lines as such. So I, I refer to these as mask-like faces. Even if they're not carved, I'll still call it a mask-like face that has a separate eyebrow, not a form line, and a mouth, and then the eye, and so on. Maybe fine lines to describe the eye socket and whatnot. But I, I, just to make that different from the kind of, a, like this is a face also, it's like a, a little bird's face with a downturned beak with an eye socket, a snout, and a lower jaw, and a, two pointed corners and two slightly rounded at least corners. But that's a form line face as opposed to a mask-like face, just to call them that. Another U-shape here. These could have overlapped, but they didn't. Here are the outside edges. Space between them comes right up there. And then he's got U-shapes at the end of the tail, and there's an ovoid overlapping a U-shape there, so the legs are real short. And there's elaborated ovoids inside of there, and they appear to be just an eye socket and a mouth and a snout and maybe a narrow mouth slit. And then secondary spaces, there's a like an eye socket there and U-shape coming this way and ovoid in the end of it here. Fine line in black tr following the edge of the U-shape. Here's a, a U-shape that has a little elaboration in the end of it of an ovoid and a, another U-shape so that he's building more detail into the secondary areas. And then the inner ovoids are black, fine lines around the inner ovoids and so on like that. Rather than form line relief in the eye. He, he just put a negative ovoid in there and carved a little mask-like face in there, like the mask-like face in the tail. And then you can see how the fine line is quite far from the inner ovoid down here. And in fact, it touches the inner ovoid up here. It's not even a separate line. So it's like the inner ovoid is floating up so high that it actually overlapped the fine line. Fine line comes up and disappears up here. But that's unusual. Usually it's continuous all the way around, even if the inner ovoid is off center. And there's a, that close-up that's sort of worth taking a look at. So this is the one that has less rod in it, and I meant the last one to be this houseboat. But it shows the structure of the tail, and it shows these 
uh, fine line U shapes. Here's a pair of fine line U shapes, with what Bill would call a tertiary U shape inside there. And they have square corners on the inside and round corners on the outside, which is something that some of the older 18th century artists, including Kajis du Ach, that I carry the name of, um, did that, where these fine lines would have square corners on the inside and round, and even secondary ones he did that way. I'm not so sure he did this, but it's quite similar to his style. And then here you can see that big ovoid in the U-shape of the tail, or one of the U-shapes of the tail, and there's the elaborated ovoid inside that with just the eye socket snout and a very narrow slit for the mouth, but it's all there. Um, and there's another interesting thing on here. It doesn't have anything to do with the designs so, so much, but you can see here that the whole surface of the spruce is adzed, right? The whole thing was adzed in the process of smoothing it out. This would have been split and then shaped with an adz, and the, the last bit of adz work would have been done in nice rows to make it a decorative effect. So here, as you can see, the adz marks. You can see the adz marks on the black, and, and here, of course, these lips have been carved back, but this other red is on the surface still, right? Because you paint the black, you paint the red, and you carve everything else. But the red has been smoothed off, so you don't see the adz mark. And you see the adz marks in the black primary. And, that, and that's an interesting thing that you see here and there again and again. Like on the, the uh, house posts of the whale house, you look at the flat design there, carved by Kajis du Ach, and the flat design on the wings of the birds and whatnot like that. The primary shows the adzing of the surface, and the secondary areas he knifed off smooth and then painted them in and then carved them. I don't know why, but it's just the way it is. And it, it, probably more than one carver in that 18th century period did that. Because I think the, um, the house posts from the Burnt House that are at Philadelphia, also flat design on a spruce panel, I think they're the same way, where you can see the adzing in the black primary but the red secondary, it's all smoothed off. Then he painted the red secondary, and then he carved it what? Could it be that in the secondary there's more detail, and so he needed a smoother surface? Yeah, that, that might, yeah I think that and might be the original motivation, yeah. If you smooth everything, they just take too long. That's, that's a very good possibility, yeah. It's probably a good idea of why it's that way. But it wouldn't have to be that way. They made that choice. So, and then these other little critters here, like, I don't know what these are, uh, embryonic salmon maybe? It's just an uh, ovoid, there's, there's no mouth, another little extension here. Then this is an arm and a hand that has a thumb. And then this little ovoid here and an extension back to there, it's like a little embryonic creature that's zooming along there. And another one here, just an ovoid, an arm and a, clawed foot, no thumb, and then zip going up there. So in a way they just f sort of fill that little space, but they probably had some representational meaning as well that we don't know about. Where is, where is that located? It's, right now they're, yeah, sorry, they're in the Portland Art Museum. Okay. And actually I think all four of them are on show these days too. Wow. It's a really great old set. Um, this is also a very old chest, very old object. This um, was f found in the woods of Prince of Wales Island in a hollow cedar decades ago by some, I think a Forest Service person, I'm not sure. But at any rate, um, it had shaman's equipment in it. It's not very big, it's about this big. And it got out into the private market years ago, and it still is there somewhere. I'm not sure who has it now. But um, it's a real interesting 
composition and a painting. Uh, it's a double box so that the sides are attached to the top and the inner box is attached to the bottom. So it's what they call a telescoping box. So when you put it together, they go like that, see? And it's got, the, the black isn't real black. You notice it's kind of reddish. And it's only a little bit different from the red, but there's the red, the red top, red bottom. I noticed that in a lot of, a lot of paintings that I've seen there, there's a lot of red under the black. Yeah, and it might be because it's, it's real common in older things, like before 1800 older things, 18th century things where, and it might be because the black was made by taking red ochre powder and you burn it and it becomes black. And it's, it's such a great pigment, I guess, to grind up and work with otherwise that they used that. And that was one form source for black paint. So if it wasn't completely carbonized black, it ends up showing more of the red. And a lot of old things, it's that way, the black is is very reddish like this. And it's also interesting that he, he dished out the eyes and slightly bulged the eye itself, the eye socket bulged the eye, but he didn't carve this detail here. He didn't carve that detail there. But all the other lines are, are carved. But again here, he dished out around the inner ovoid, domed the inner ovoid slightly, but then didn't carve between the fine line and didn't carve in the relief. Maybe it was gonna and didn't, I don't know. Um, and it's got, here's a little U-shape with two smaller U-shapes that have ovoids, but they're not ovoids, they're rectangles. They're actually square cornered things right here. Interesting. And the face, ovoid shaped main head, is smack on the bottom instead of being up here in the middle somewhere closer to the top. And the, there's usually the ovoid in the upper corner, ovoid in the lower corner, right? And here, it's not just an ovoid in the upper corner, not just a little design thing. It's a whole profile head. There's the head, the eye socket, cheek design, the mouth coming across. There's a leg and a foot attached to it. So this is a whole nother creature up here on top, bird probably. The beak just doesn't turn down in the center. But it's got bird-like feet and kind of like a feather back here. And it's very possible, in fact, there are other examples like this that show some of them are closer, some of them are actually tall boxes rather than a chest. But they have the main figure, and then there's really literally another figure up here above it. And that's probably the source of the more common just plain ovoid in the upper corner, so on like that. And there's some that have the, the primary face up here and down the, against the bottom, there's another face. It's clearly another face. And, and then later on, as that got simplified, it became just a ovoid in each corner and it's not really a literal face. Just like up here, there ended up an ovoid up here in this corner, but not usually a literal face. But there's a handful of things like this and some other really early objects that show it's a whole nother figure up there. But that became simplified in later years. Anyway, it's got some other really odd things about it, really interesting odd things. It has the two nostril U-shapes like we saw in those other chest design. But then there's also this little spiral thing that looks like a carved, you know, a sculptural nostril here, only curved up instead of down. And that's all within the nose there. Then instead of an elaborated eye, it's just the ovoid shaped relief, but that's enough to break it up so that it's not, that's not the biggest black space anymore, this is. And very simple, solid red cheek design there, big area there but it's a solid, simple cheek design. And the oldest things, that's how it is. It's, a, it's just a solid black shape. It was later, as the design system evolved, people thought, well, I'm not gonna leave that solid red. I'm gonna work a little form line complex into that cheek area. 
And then we saw examples where they're more elaborate even than that. So th this, this is a, this probably, I mean this, according to an article that was in the Craig paper way back when this came out, it said this was the grave, uh, part of the grave of a shaman named such and such who was active in the late 18th century. So there was inside there was a little mask, a rattle, and some other little figures and stuff. Were but there remains in there? I think there was a skull, in fact, yeah. Um, but the chest is probably way older than the late 18th century. This could be three or four hundred years old. And it, it, these kind of objects show what everything that was done since then evolved from. So this is the old timers in, in the most basic form, but e even this is pretty elaborate, right? I mean, but um, it, it shows the development of some of the detail areas in a much more basic form, where later chests became way more elaborate than that, and also larger. As I said, that one's only about that wide, and, and many 19th century chests are like this wide, and maybe even some this tall, where that's a small little thing. And also, you notice the lid is, I mean, the bottom is really thick, and of course that's hollowed out as well. The lid is really thick, and that's hollowed out as well too, and that's really common in these older chests, that the lid and the bottom both are really thick where the later ones in the 19th century, uh, the chest itself, the bent corner sides were bigger. The bottom's usually just a thin slab, not hollowed out. And the chest lid is about half of that in proportion, but also hollowed out. So, so a lot of things changed over time. There's the other side of the same one. And it's sort of more typical of a, of a chest layout in that there's an ovoid down in this corner, ovoid in the upper corner, the main head, the body area below it, so the head's not sitting right down on the bottom. And then there's a space between here and the, and the side, space between there and the side. But even here, in this ovoid here, this little, it's not really a U-shape, but it kind of is, extends out and then drops down, has a very beak-like character on both sides, more so than the average one from decades later, um, where you don't see any suggestion, really, of, a, of another creature. So there's no mouth here, but it looks like an eye socket and a beak. And then in the bot in the over here on the side, he's just got a simple Again, well, let's look at the cheek design. Big area, solid red. No elaboration in here. No elaboration in here other than the ovoid eye relief. And then on the both sides, it's a simple secondary U-shape with a fine line across the bottom, hollowed out, painted blue. And then two solid secondary U-shapes on top of that, just a crescent space at the bottom, square corners in the center, round corners on the outside edge. Uh, again, that's a 18th century and before thing. And then the same little complex, one, two, three U-shapes, is used opposite direction here, one broad U-shape and two smaller ones. And the same thing over here. Uh, short, broad U-shapes in the mouth, Round corners here, square corners here. And then in the body, there's one broad U-shape, and then there's the same little trio of U-shapes on each side of that, one and then two, three. So each of these other secondary spaces are almost the same stuff in them, very simplified. Broad lines, the carved out areas are quite small. They're limited to just this wee little space in here a little space around the inner ovoid there, here, a little broader there, but still not huge, and tiny little carved out spaces here, 
that look how small these trigons are. They're just like a little eat. But that's a little trigon where the outside edge of that form line comes around. Another one here on the outside edge of this ovoid. Another one up here. Another one here. But these are really tiny ones and these aren't huge or broad either one. So <clears throat> the carved out areas are minimal and the painted areas occupy most of the space. And most of the space is primary blackish color. So now why is that? Well, hundreds of years ago, even thousands of years ago, they didn't have fancy, nice, big crooked knives and straight knives to carve all that stuff out. What did they have? They had mussel shell knives and beaver teeth and stuff like that. So, and interestingly, these areas that <clears throat> anybody today would V-cut on these older things, these are not V-cut lines. And I don't believe they are on this one either. They're not V-cut lines. This is an aside. So today, a person would carve that out by taking a little V out of the surface. But these are not that way. They're made by a, a straight cut down and another straight cut down at a slight angle and the bottom is just chiseled out. So it's not a V cut, it's a flat bottom cut. And all these spaces between the form lines are flat bottom cuts. And I, and I think it's because they were using a, something like a muscle shell knife that wasn't long, that was sharp, but that you couldn't lean over and put pressure on because it would break, it's too brittle. But you could cut more or less straight down, more or less straight down, and then take another piece of muscle shell and chisel out between them. It was easier to do that with the limited tools they had. And then, like a lot of human things, even after you get better tools or whatever, you still do it the same way for a while. Or maybe you get, you found a shard of metal and you shape it like a muscle shell knife, because that's, that's what you know, right? So you do that, and then you do that for a while. It's, it's only later that you realize, hey, I don't have to do it like that. This metal, I can make this nice long thing, and then I'll make V-cuts. So, like, for example, uh, you know, uh, many of you have probably seen a muscle shell fish knife, where you get a big muscle shell and you sharpen that outside curved edge, and that's what uh, they'd use to fillet fish with. And in the Burke and probably other museums, I saw there's a nice little copper, maybe it's brass, but it's a metal copy of a mussel shell that's been sharpened on the same edge that they used to fly fish with. So they took the metal and made it into a mussel shell shape and then used it. And that's common, and people still do that kind of thing, you know. The first automobiles looked like wagons. They had open seats, you know, and their roof up here, and wooden spokes the whole bit. I mean, it's part of it's technological, but part of it's a concept, you know? Wagons is what they knew. We'll, take a, we'll make a wagon and put a motor on it. And it was quite a while before they started looking like cars instead of like wagons. So it's the same kind of thing. There's another old timer chest uh, from the cake area. Brown not black, reddish black form lines. Uh, big ovoid shaped head here. But look how they elaborated the eye here. There's not only a profile head, there's a leg and a foot. And again, the carved out areas are very tiny. The inner ovoids are big, so that the carved out areas are tiny. Here's that same trio of U shapes, but they put a little in on the inside edge, like another tiny U-shape, and you see that kind of a form end up in Chilkat weaving. Yeah. These are square corners, here, round ovoid. Look at that big, wide ovoid with a big, wide ovoid-shaped relief rather than an elaborated form and a very tiny carved-out area around it. Plain red cheek design, even though there's a lot of detail here, they didn't do it here. Here's the same set of U-shapes in the mouth. And then what's this? Here's four little grooves, five, 
round bottom grooves hollowed out, separated by V-cuts or something, or a flat bottom cut, and painted blue. So there's a lot, a lot of unusual things in these old works that some became conventionalized traditions and some didn't. I can't think of any other chest that has a whole little creature in it like that, but there you go. And look how much this ovoid overlaps the bottom of the head. So th that's really the top of this ovoid form line right all the way up to there. It also overlaps the side of this square U-shape and that U-shape is overlapped by the edge of this ovoid. And then what was the beak in the other one is just a little triangle, but it does turn down there as well on this one. Yeah, it does on both sides. Just a tiny little ink <coughs> suggesting the beak, like that's again another face up there. And at some point, this was probably the eye socket of another face completely. So anyway, it's interesting to see these older things. Thick lid, thick bottom, and you see it's all grooved. The lid's all grooved very nicely. What are the circles on the top of the line? Um, these circles here? Oh, the inlay. Those are those um, little shells that come from a, a marine snail, saltwater snail, that doesn't live here. They live in only very a few places Princess Royal Island, the Northern Queen Charlotte's, and Barclay Sound on Vancouver Island. Yeah, operculum, yeah. Operculum means the door, it's Latin for door. And it's when the snail disappears in the shell, it closes this little shell door. It's, it's attached to its foot so that they, nobody can get at it. See, if you find a garden snail, they have an operculum, but it's just like a little leathery thing that closes the opening. But on these marine snails, certain ones on this area and other parts of the Pacific, there are bigger snails with a round opercula. But when they, when they disappear in the shell, it, they close this little shell door. And so those are the little shell doors. Is, is that what, what was on the other Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's just inlaid like that. Sometimes it's used to represent teeth. And here's the end of that same chest, and look how unusual this is. Here's the big, broad ovoid for the head, really wide on the sides as well as the top. Funny, tiny little trigons up here in the corner to finish out the corner square. Then just a simple body for this, and an eye form in it, but that's a real square-cornered rectangle for the eye itself, instead of an ovoid. Then the leg, foot, uh, forearm, clawed foot, and wings. It's like a humanoid raven type thing or something, where it's got a mask-like human face and a bird's wing, a human foot, and a bird's foot. And really square U-shapes there, circle reliefs in the U-shape, something else you see in Chilkat weaving. So the reason Chilcats have blankets and stuff have square corners in them is not because it's easier to weave square corners because they weave plenty of round corners all the time, right? It's because the painting style that was done on the pattern boards that the weavers weave from included this early style that had square cornered U-shapes in it. So the square cornered U-shapes predate the Chilcat blankets, I think. And um, that's why they ended up in there. And then once that became traditional in Chilcat weaving, it stayed that way all the way up into the 20th century and today, where uh, other painted forms evolved and you don't see square U-shapes after the 18th century. So are we used up of time here now? Pretty much, huh? Well, so what we'll do tomorrow, um, We'll look at some other examples of different kinds of objects. Uh, and not only the older ones, but a quick look at how fast those cha changes came about in, from these older works to what was common 100 years after this. And we'll do more composing as well. 
Um, we'll do some other ovoids like this and then we'll start building creatures. Faces, bodies, limbs, wings, tails, and all that kind of stuff. All right? Very good. Thank you, thank you.